China has maintained an impressive growth trajectory for many years, lifting millions from poverty. But the growth can't continue forever, and we are seeing a slowing economy and trouble in the housing market. What can we make of it, and where is China headed? Today, we're going to talk to someone who is doing business in China during the boom to talk about his new book and to see what we can learn about China's future. Hey, everybody, this is Chris Brandt here. Welcome to another Future Podcast. Today, I have with me Mark Atkinson, author of Risky Business in Rising China, which chronicles his life as an American entrepreneur in a surging superpower. So let's hear about his journey and what he sees as the next chapter in China's story. Welcome, Mark. Good morning, Chris, and thank you for having me on your show. Um, I'm excited. Oh, thanks for being here. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, to share with everyone uh, the story of you know China's modernization and some my own personal experience of that. I haven't gotten all the way through your book here, uh, risky business uh, in in rising China, um, and I was just talking to you about how how great I think the the book is. Um, it, it, lots of really interesting stuff. I haven't made it all the way through yet, but I'm 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 I'm, I'm getting there, and I can't wait to to finish it. But there's some just um, really interesting insights, and I think it's a it's it's uh, cool that you did it through telling your story. You know, you you kind of get these interesting personal perspectives on on you know what China's like. There, there are a lot of China books out there, and you know what I was really trying to focus on was telling the story through my eyes and, you know, specific experiences that I'd had. And I think part of what is unique in this story is that I moved through my career through many different industries that were radically different from each other. You know, everything from aircraft maintenance to automotive parts, uh, mobile technology to venture capital, electric vehicles to aviation asset <laughs> trading. So, uh, and and all kinds of crazy stories about corruption, uh, about investing, you know, taking risks, uh, working with Chinese entrepreneurs, seeing the private sector develop. It it was a lot of fun. But I I, I think when people read uh, uh, this story, it gives them sort of a deeper sense of what was happening in China over the last thirty years. So what so what motivated you to write this book? I mean, like I know you you, you have some you know uh, history, family history with your grandfather there. Can you talk about like you know your motivations around it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll answer that with two things. First of all, you know why China, and you know a lot of people always <laughs> sure. ask me that question. Um, so it actually goes back over 80 years, as, as you mentioned. My grandfather was actually an officer in the U.S. Navy. And in those days, this was actually the 1930s, uh, he would be stationed in a ship off of uh, China. And in the 1930s, the Japanese army you know, was occupying China. So it was a wartime situation. And my father, who at that time was 12 and his younger brother, Ted, uh, would travel to China to catch up with, you know, their father and mother, and they would stay in a Japanese-occupied city in China called Qingdao. And, you know, through that, they uh, had a very deep impression as young boys of, you know, what China was like and how chaotic and crazy it was in those days. And then my father, you know, later on uh, had more exposure to Asia. He would he at one time was actually the general counsel to the Asian Development Bank in the Philippines, and, and we lived in Manila for two years. Um, and then in 1982, my family traveled to China. Uh, and so picture yourself, I was a college freshman. 1982 was a very different time. Oh, my gosh. Sure. So, so people don't realize that in 1982, China was one of the poorest countries in the world. I mean, it was actually yeah. poorer than India on a you know GDP per capita basis. And you know, so we arrived on a Pan Am 747 that was nearly empty. And you know, there were soldiers outside on the tarmac and you know, padded overcoats and fur hats with AK 47s. And you know, everything was gray. Uh, th there was basically no highways, there was no tall buildings, there was no neon. Um, and, you know, the Chinese were sort of stoically there in threadbare mouse suits and riding, you know, simple black bicycles. 
Uh, and so one could say, well, you know, the China that you saw of 82, you know, how could that possibly have excited you? But uh, there also was, you know, the beginning of an opening up to in, in China. And in fact, you could see, you know, entrepreneurs on the streets selling blue jeans and vending different things. And in the Western media, you know, they talked about Coca-Cola. They talked about Procter & Gamble and Boeing all trying to get into China. So, you know, from that, I had a, I guess, a combination of, uh, you know, the exotic aspect of uh, a country like China, uh, a youthful wanderlust, and, you know, a sense that there was business opportunity there. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, sure. you know, as, a, as an engineer out of college, I, I, when I graduated, instead of going to AT&T, I ended up going to China. Um, and so, yeah. you know, so, so, so then on, you know, related to uh, why write a book about then all these years spent in China, and I ended up spending about 30 years of my career there. Uh, so, so a, a couple things. One is, uh, you know, from a family perspective, uh, one always would like to communicate to your children, you know, what it was that you actually did. And and in my case, yeah. uh, some of the crazy stuff I did was hard hard to explain to the children, and so they, you know, often were unable to answer <laughs> in school. Like, what does dad do? So, you know, one is write a book that explains to my kids uh, what, what what happened in all those years. Did your did your kids read your book? Yes, they did. <laughs> a little bit like pulling teeth, Chris. <laughs> but it was yeah, I find all these these great great ideas I have with my kids. It's like it just doesn't always pan out the way I think. <laughs> and then and, and and then I guess you know two other reasons to write the book. You know, as I mentioned. Um, my career uh, covered uh, quite a broad range of industries, um, and and this was uh, my analogy is that as China modernized, think of it as China, uh, the Chinese economy built like an enormous ocean wave, almost like a tsunami, and it built and built and built, and it was, you know, living and working in China was a little bit like surfing this enormous wave of opportunity. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, the opportunities kept coming in new industries. And so, as I said, you know, I, I started with I, I represented uh, a aerospace OEM to introduce, you know, modern aircraft to the Chinese fleet. And literally, you know, in the book, there are scenes of me standing in the cockpit with Chinese pilots trying to make sure that, you know, the equipment's operating properly and, and uh, nothing breaks down. And then, you know, I moved into uh, the hinterland of China and I I ended up uh, going into manufacturing. Uh, And, you know, one of the funny things uh, people might not remember, but in those days, uh, you know, Japan was the big deal. Japan was the economic juggernaut. It's an interesting story because I remember the early days of Japan. You know, everybody was saying, you know, oh, I don't want to buy buy cheap Japanese stuff. I don't want to buy. Oh, they just, you know, steal our ideas and make knock off cheap versions of it. And then all of a sudden you, you're like, oh, wait a minute. These are really high quality goods and they're innovating quite a bit, you know? <laughs> and then they became this huge power. Now everybody's like, oh God, can you, did you get that from Japan? <laughs> you know, it's yeah, it's yeah, funny so, to see how that completely turned around. So, so uh, you know, so implemented a Toyota production system <laughs> approach in a factory in the, in the distant hinterland. Uh, you know, the, the joke was that the, Mountains were high and the emperor was far away and we were often a part of Sichuan. That's an old, old joke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we, uh, a lot of crazy stuff happened uh, far away from Beijing, you know, where the yeah. local officials were uh, basically doing things their way. Um, and then I uh, I moved into a, a, a business in Beijing uh, where it was completely corrupt from top to bottom, you know, the the salespeople, the procurement people were taking bribes and kickbacks. Um, the head of the factory was uh, driving trucks into the factory and stealing parts directly out of the factory to sell on his own account. Man, so th- there was a bunch of crazy stuff where you know I had to turn that around, and then um, you know jumped into venture capital, uh, and then jumped into uh, the private sector with. Uh, different entrepreneurs uh, who were, you know, guys who'd been self-made and and had come up from nothing. And, you know, one of the amazing things, Chris, is that when you look at the contrast between when I started in China, again, you know, the threadbare Mao suits, and then I'm I'm dealing with, you know, guys in designer suits driving Mercedes. um, And 
uh, you know, they they've come a long way. So one one was the it was this uniqueness of my career in moving through these different industries um, and different opportunities. And then the other was that when I first went to China in 1982, China formally ended collectivization of mm. agriculture. So think about that, that farmers could now grow their own crops and sell their own crops for, you know, yeah. for cash. And uh, the whole country basically moved away from central planning towards market oriented reforms. And over the course of 30 years, you know, which is basically the span of this book, uh, 800 million people came out of poverty. That's crazy. I don't think there's ever been anything like that. Yeah. I mean, one could argue that it's probably the biggest event in our lifetime, you know, certainly bigger than the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, and the end of communism in Eastern Europe. Um, you know, so I, I, I felt that the book uh, could convey this, the, the power of, you know, what had happened in modernization, the, you know, the radical changes that had occurred. Um, and then also, you know, I guess one final thing is that I have an interest to inspire, you know, young people to, to uh, you know, to expose themselves to places like China. And, you know, so I wanted them in reading this book to, to get a feel for, you know, what it was like to take risks, what it was like to reinvent yourself um, and and what was some of the excitement of working in that foreign environment? You know, a lot of that bled out of China too. I mean, if you look at at, at sort of you know Singapore, you know the the Malaysia, you know the, Taiwan, you know they all have these kind of um, significant you know growth matters. You know, where, where where they they lifted a lot of people out of out of poverty, not not quite the way that China did it. But yeah, there's, there does seem to be um, a propensity to do that in in Asia. It was the kind of environment where you know almost every day you'd look out the window and you say, "Oh my God, you know, where did that building come from, or where did that highway come from?" Um, so there there was an excitement about living there that uh, you know you could see real change taking place. You could see people's living standards go up. I mean, a lot of my Chinese friends had gone from you know people my age had gone from being allocated to a job in a work unit out of college to finally ending up later on in their lives in the private sector. Um, you know, earning a real wage and having real aspirations, you know, rather than being in this world of state planning with basically everything determined by the authorities. I can't even imagine what it must have been like as an outs you know, a foreigner to be there during this period. Um, but I, I know that, you know, we as Americans have a lot of really big misconceptions about China and about business in China and about, about the whole culture in general, right? I mean, can you, can you speak to some of the things that you, you felt were like kind of the biggest misconceptions that you saw people having or you yourself had? Yeah. I mean, I think for a lot of people, one of the biggest misconceptions, particularly, you know, in business today is that people look at China and they think of, oh, this is a big monolithic, you know, state-owned economy. And what they don't realize is that, um, you know, the state owned part of the economy is no more than maybe 30 to 40 percent of the economy. And that basically what happened in China over the last 30 years is China went from being completely state owned with no private uh, companies to, uh, you know, 70 percent of the economy is the private sector and 80% of the jobs are with the private sector. And, you know, what is the private sector? The private sector is a hive of, you know, adaptable, you know, super quick thinking, uh, very flexible millions of enterprises, uh, you know, with entrepreneurs, mostly self-made, uh, you know, running these companies. And I think that for uh, Americans doing business with China, the important thing to realize is that with the Chinese private sector, you know, Chinese entrepreneurs, for the most part, are free agents. Uh, and so there's a lot of flexibility there. And that culturally also Chinese entrepreneurs are, you know, it's not about country. It's, it's, it's 
to a large degree, it really is what is in it for them. Um, mm-hmm. And 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 so the opportunities to, you know, negotiate partnerships or negotiate deals with Chinese entrepreneurs are uh, just as good as they would be here in America. Um, and and I personally experienced that. You know, I worked with yeah. Uh, I worked with entrepreneurs who were in the internet sector who were dealing with payments and gaming and entertainment uh, and all kinds of stuff. And you know, one thing I would highlight is that. Uh, in China, you had to move very quickly, in the, particularly in consumer segments, because things change very rapidly. Um, and China is an economy that's characterized by, if somebody's making a profit, hundreds of millions of other entrepreneurs pile in. You know, so the marginal <laughs> return gets driven down. Um, so, so, so that is a challenge. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is amazing, like how big you know, China is and, and how many, you know, like when they, you know, they have t- populations in their cities that are just tens of millions. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, you know, wild there. And, and they have, you know, they've created more middle class than the entire population of the United States over there, you know? So like these, the scale of what happens in China is really hard to wrap my head around. Think about the middle class. Like you said, you know, the middle class is uh, greater than the population of the United States now. Now it's a, you know it's about 400 million people, and you know these are urban you know dwellers. Uh, but you know a good example was this guy James James Lee who worked with me in the automotive parts world, and then later on uh, joined me in the electric vehicle business. You know when he was growing up, uh, the people were absolutely destitute, and uh, it certainly didn't. It, it, you were lucky if you had a radio, or you were lucky if you had a bicycle. Uh, and you know, the world he lives in today, he owns several apartments. Um, he owns several cars and, and, uh, he's actually moved himself now to Canada. So, uh, you know, he's moved on, but, uh, I, 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 the urban middle class is an interesting group for Americans. You know, we sometimes wonder why don't the Chinese want democracy? And, you know, one thing to think about with the urban middle class is that, uh, these guys are heavily invested in things like property. And I, I know we're going to talk about that shortly, but, uh, you know, 70% of their wealth is tied up in, in residential property. And if you had full blown democracy, you know, there's a big divide in China between rural and urban and, uh, full blown democracy could result in, you know, significant wealth redistribution. So, the urban middle class is surprisingly conservative and, and you know, fully supportive of the central government and keeping things, yeah. you know, authoritarian the way they are today. Keep the status quo. You're right, <laughs> right. So let's get into the housing. Yeah. Um, you know, like, I think we've, we've heard the stories of China building incredible housing developments. You know, they reproduced, you know, Paris, France. In, in one of them uh, with a, an actual Eiffel Tower. You know, they, they've recreated, you know, different locations. Um, and they've, they've, they've been a leader in like eco-friendly cities and, and mm-hmm. green cities and things like that. But I, I, they've drastically overbuilt, right, yes. it seems. And, and they've, they've created, um, in, in generating that kind of growth, they've created a lot of problems for themselves that may be coming due very soon right now or are, are coming due presently. Yeah. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So, you know, if you think about uh, housing reform began in the, in the 1990s, um, you know, so up until that time, people basically lived in housing that was terrible and was allocated, you know, by their work unit. Um, So whatever crappy apartment you had in Beijing, you know, was basically given to you by the work unit. And in the 1990s, they converted a lot of that housing to, you know, they handed it over to the people. And on top of that, they legitimized, you know, the monetization of land. uh, So local governments could sell land for uh, residential development. And so people started buying houses. And what happened, Chris, is that, uh, as you can imagine, in tier one cities, the uh, the benefits of living in Beijing and Shanghai and Guangzhou and big cities like that uh, was, you know, enormous in terms of health benefits and education yeah. for the kids. So the value of these properties shot up and it got to a point, uh, certainly in the last, you know, 15 years where it just became speculative. So, 
Mm -hmm. You know, the urban middle class developed a very significant stake in residential property and, you know, a stake that was not just they living in the house that they own, but they own multiple apartments. Um, right. and, and, and so you now have a situation where, on average, uh, the number of apartments outnumbers the number of people who can live in them because it just was, you know, driven th by this speculative wave. And it's a structural problem. You know, in this right. in this case, it it wasn't a recent policy mistake. You know, some people argue that the pressure that the central government put on developers recently to deleverage and 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 to to, to pull back uh, was the thing that brought the house of cards down. But I mean, the reality is that structurally they were going to run into this problem, and and I think why it's such a serious problem in China, Chris, is that. For the urban middle class, this is their, uh, you know, this is how they build wealth. Yeah, it's their um, life savings. It's their life savings. And they don't, the stock market is not really seen as, you know, a place to park money and, and you know, long term and, and make money. It's it, it's much more. And that's not doing well either. Yeah, the stock market is <laughs> Because tanking. of the housing market. <laughs> yeah, and, and the stock market is is quite a casino. And um so there's this concept also in China called financial repression, which is that people who leave their money in bank deposits, uh, the you know the return on your deposit is tiny, and uh, that's intentional, you know, because the state basically wants to uh, have people finance, uh, you know, the development of industry and the building of infrastructure. So you know they get bank savers to basically pay for everything. Um, and, and so just going back to property, then if the property sector goes down, you're taking away the primary, you know, wealth driver and, you know, wealth preserver of the most important educated group in the country. Yeah. And, you know, so where do you go from there? I'm going to speculate. I, you might not want me to answer the question immediately, but I do no, think. Go for it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I do think, Chris, that the the property sector is uh, is a is a big, big problem, and I and I think that the state doesn't really have an answer to that. Unfortunately, sometimes you know, speculative bubbles just have to deflate, uh, yeah. and and you have to take the consequences. Um, you know, we we did that in the financial crisis of uh, 08 and 09, um, and we've done it at other times, the savings and loan crisis. Uh, but, you know, you got to take the pain. So I think that what what directions can China go when you've got a loss of confidence from the people, particularly driven by, you know, deflating assets, deflating wealth? Um, and, and I would argue that uh, there's further work that can be done to privatize the state-owned part of the economy. So, mm. uh, you know, you've probably heard that there, there are big segments of the economy where the state has monopolies. So there's things like right. ener energy, telecommunications, certain aspects of transportation, aviation being one of them, um, you know, the, the banking sector, financial services. So, uh, yeah. If you want the Chinese people to continue to feel that they have a stake in the economy, to a certain degree, you have to you know, to drive down a path of privatization and put more of the shareholding into the hands of the people. You know, it could right. be it could be pension funds, it could be direct ownership by people, but you know, you understand that, like for example, here in America, that. Uh, we are, you know, largely driven by uh, having a stake in in the economy beyond just the house we live in, um, right. and 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 so I think that's partly the answer. I think that the other part of the answer is that uh, China still has markets that are manipulated or restricted in certain ways. You know, so right. obviously land sales is completely dictated by the government, and they can manipulate the the price of land. Um, and just by the way, you know, I don't think you'll see 
a dramatic collapse of the property sector because remember that the supply of land, you know, in, uh, the pipeline of new land coming in is completely controlled by the government. Um, right. And, and that banks also can restrain their, you know, pullback Lending. on credit, yeah. uh, if, uh, you know, based on a government mandate. So I think what you'll see is, I, I, I think you'll see this slowdown continue. Uh, and I think you'll see it at a gradual rate. But, I mean, that's still sort of the kiss of death. I mean, remember what happened to Japan in yeah. 1990. Uh, you know, it, it entered decades of flatlining, basically. They're, they're still trying to give away some houses in yeah. Japan. Yeah. I mean, here's a funny statistic. I mean, you probably saw recently that the Japanese stock market just to return to the highs that it was at in 1989. And that was like 30 wow. years ago. So like that, you know, that begs a the question then, you know, like, you know, you're, you're saying like, you see like the, the, the saving, you know, part of this is sort of getting more participation in the economy to some extent too. Right. And, you know, like, and it's, you know, I'm going to, you know, hype the book again, risky business, right. um, you know, <laughs> you know, getting into the stock market right now seems like a little bit of a risky, you know, proposition that sort of economic partition seems like that could be dangerous. And I, and, and, you know, we're looking at an economic slowdown across the country and, you know, you mentioned the fact that um, that that Beijing Beijing is far in the mountains are high, right? Um, I don't know that there's great you know control of the country, you know, by the government necessarily, and how that could unravel as well, you know. And then you look at this, you know, the the younger generation. You talk about the younger generation in your book, yeah. You know, kind of, like how is that? What what are they handing them? You yeah. know, and how are they going to react to it? Because they've got a different perspective on all of this. You know, they've kind of grown up in a in a world of more prosperity, right? Yes. So they don't remember that huge rise. You know, so w w what does that all lead to? Yeah. So, so uh, let me first address the uh, the comment you made about you know central government and control, because I think you know here in America sometimes uh, we have a paranoia about the implications of. Uh, you know, the Chinese central government manipulating uh, things economically, cornering markets in precious metals, cornering markets in batteries, uh, inundating the world with electric vehicles. And, and people should realize that China is actually less controlled than, uh, than what we imagine. And, you know, again, this, yeah. goes, this goes back to the fact that the private sector is very large and, 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 and really sort of, uh, to a certain degree, herd-like. You know, so what does it mean for us? It means that in the world of you know lithium ion batteries, China is going to flood the world with lithium ion batteries. And if they can't export them to us, they'll build battery factories in the United States to make them, which is, you know, they're already Ford is already working with one of those companies. Um, yeah. So solar panels are a great example. You know, the Chinese have flooded the world. And so everybody can put solar panels on their roof for a very affordable price here in the U.S., yeah. Um, yeah. And and so I think, you know, I think that what we're going to see with the private sector, and, and this will include, you know, electric vehicles, is that private entrepreneurs will make, you know, more and more decisions about, in order to reduce their own risk profile inside of China, how do they diversify their activities to outside of the country? And, you know, obviously, yeah. you know, Asia will benefit, but I think the U.S. will benefit as well. That We'll see more and more bridging activities of you know chinese coming here to set up and, and i think that you know we should not worry about that 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 uh obviously the experience that we had with the japanese with toyota and honda and nissan coming to the u.s uh and you know people coming with semiconductor factories and other types of factories it builds american jobs it makes us more competitive. And, and certainly we saw that in the automotive sector in the United States uh, 30 years ago. I've, I've been watching people like car shopping in China uh -huh. and the EV market there is huge. Yeah. They, they got a lot, they have a lot of different car EV car companies there. And, and I I'm seeing things there too, that I'm like, wow, that's kind of, better than what we've got going here. I'm like, you know, they're selling cars with thousand kilometer range. Yes. You know, for cheap. 
Yes, you know? yeah, yeah. And, and, and what's amazing about that, just by the way, is that uh, almost all of those electric vehicle companies in China are private and are recently started up, you know, so that they're, yeah. they're not like the traditional first auto works and second auto works owned by the central government. So these are, you know, very nimble, you know, BYD is the best example. BYD, uh, a lot of people don't realize this. BYD used to be a mobile phone maker and got into the car business. Uh, and then, you know, you've got Lee Auto and Xpeng and all these guys. Um, I, I would say, Chris, I mean, people should look more closely and realize that a lot of these companies aren't making a whole lot of money. You know, yeah. they're uh, so... Well, but they they need to they need to start exporting their cars to the U.S. and yes. being able to do that. Yeah. But the problem is like so you know you know this is an interesting time because we're having this whole debate about TikTok, right? Yeah. And Bite Dance, you know, and like their stake in, in in TikTok, even though it's a Singaporean you know country, uh, you know of origin, it's it's got the the Bite Dance China piece to it, and that you know that is a you know especially in this year of politics in election year. That's going to be a real like you know try watch out China China China's going to come and get you China's going to you know like how do you how, you know but that, like if you're if you're a car manufacturer in that that space you know um, how do how do we get over that hurdle and like introduce some of these really interestingly competitive cars I mean I think some of these cars could be you know really um, go head to head with some of the bigger manufacturers now but. You know, you're gonna like, well, but but what if China takes control of your car and drives you into a ditch, you know, or <laughs> or into a tree or something? And you're like, okay, but why would they do that? You know, I, you know, it's just like we have this sort of warfare mentality about you know how how China and 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 the United States interact, and I think that um, you know, obviously, with some of the tensions that have been coming up and especially over Taiwan and things like that. Yeah. I mean, there, there are legitimate concerns, I, you know, I suppose there too, but, um, but you you know, like you say, there's uh, entrepreneurs there who have nothing to do with the government and are completely independent of that. So like, how, how do we, how do we get the good stuff without the bad stuff? I guess. You know? no, no, it's a good question. And, and, you know, I'll tell you, I, the last time I was in China was actually just a few months ago. I was there in September of last year and, you know, they have a rideshare company called DD, and uh, I think almost every driver who picked me up was driving an electric car. And, mm -hmm. you know, what you notice is that the electronics are very, very sophisticated. Um, yeah. And naturally, you know, because uh, one of China's strengths is uh, the whole IT industry and in the electronics sector. So sure. uh, if, you, if, if people are familiar with Tesla's, you know, with the mini pad on the, or the iPad on the dash, you know, China is basically that uh, you know, on steroids. Full TV, yeah. yeah, it's full TV screen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, you know, so how do we get the good stuff? So, so you know, uh, when we started uh, raising tariffs on China about five years ago or six years ago, I actually, you know, I, I thought that was probably a good thing. You, you know, that that we know we started we needed to start to sort of level the playing field with China. Um, I'm not a believer in shutting us out of any type of exposure to this, you know, technology and, and competitive competition. But, you know, to me, the answer would be, OK, we won't let you export your cars from China to America. But if you want to build your cars in America, then we should do that, because, you know, the ancillary benefits of that, in addition to U.S. jobs, is that, you know, we would build up battery businesses. We would build up all kinds of, you know, associated stuff. And, you know, GM and Ford would learn that, hey, you're going to have to employ some, like, software guys to actually make, a you know, a, a future car. Uh, and, you know, to your point about young people, I, I will say this about American young people is that American young people should be rooting for that outcome. Because it would be great to end up in a job in a Chinese electric vehicle factory in Ohio or, or wherever yeah. and learn all of their technology and, you know, then be able to, you know, to bridge that to uh, local companies here in the U.S. So I, I, I think I think, Chris, we definitely have to expose ourselves to it. Um, I, I think that just letting 
exports, you know, just importing a ton of EVs from China is not the answer. But I do think that uh, localizing Chinese EVs in America would go a long way to making us competitive and also just giving U.S. consumers, you know, better car products. Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 an interesting it's an interesting space, and it's because it, the thing you know I'm going to go back to that 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 example I talked about with Japan, you know, where all of a sudden you know they stopped copying stuff and they started inventing stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and it, it was amazing, and and I'm seeing that happen with China too, but China is so much bigger, it's 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 lots of fits and starts all over the place, you know. There's yeah. really high quality stuff, and then there's just really low quality stuff coming out too. Like I use a lot of DJI equipment. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, between drones and, you know, microphones and lavaliers and, you know, like there's, there's just, it's a great innovative company that, yeah. that DJI, DJI is, you know? So like, you know, there's a lot of those, you know, but there's a lot of the other stuff too. And, and, and I think, you know, I think you're right. We, we do have to recognize the fact that China's reached that stage where they're innovating new products and new, you know, markets. Um, and I think we got to participate in those too, right? You yeah. know, so it, it, it's, a, it's a complex issue. So I personally experienced when I was over there, you know, several cases where the Chinese developed in a direction that was really, you know, based on the, the, the situation in their economy at that time. So, you know, a good example was at the end of the 20th century, uh, you had Chinese people who had basically no computers and, you know, their first interaction with the Internet was going to be a mobile phone. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, so I joke about in my book that, I went into the mobile internet and the mobile internet in America basically meant, you know, your laptop connecting through Wi-Fi at Starbucks. Um, but in China, you know, it really did mean uh, downloading stuff to your phone. Uh, it could be entertainment, you know, it could be yeah. uh, local services, whatever. Uh, so uh, a lot of what we did in those early days of the 2000s was geared towards catering to people on their mobile phones. And then, yeah. you know, more, more specifically, so if you think about the payment world, there's a funny thing that, you know, U.S. tourists encounter when they go to China now, which is that you can't pay for anything unless you have a, <laughs> you a, a, phone. You know, a mobile phone and your mobile phone has to be able to read a QR code and pay for it. You know, and yeah, so it, it's yeah, like totally. the Chinese are like, oh, crap, we've got to figure out how uh, we can facilitate foreigners to pay for things. Um, so they are, I mean, they are figuring out how to link, you know, foreign credit cards to it's called WeChat Pay and Alipay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's so prevalent that if you went and bought, you know, something from a street vendor like a hamburger or something, you know, or a dumpling, uh, you need to have the ability to read a QR code yeah. because they're not taking cash at the street vendor. Uh, so it's 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 they've gone in a completely different direction. Um, and, you know, here in America, we have a legacy thing of bank cards yeah. and credit cards, and it's just hard to get out of that. Well, and, and wired lines. I mean, that yeah. was one of the advantages that China had. They didn't have as many wired telephone lines as we had, so they could just skip right over that and go straight to mobile. Yeah, yeah. So so, so I, I want to highlight, you, you, you did raise the question about Chinese youth and, and sort of the direct, what's the direction of China. So I, I felt, Chris, it was really important at the end of my book to to talk about something that was an optimistic message. Um, and I certainly didn't want to, you know, rehash CNBC or Bloomberg and, no. and you know, what was going on in China today. Thank you uh, for not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I probably wouldn't be very good at it anyway. But uh, so, you know, I thought about the fact that, you know, Gen Z and millennials literally grew up when China did a 180 degree turn away from communism and, you know, Deng Xiaoping basically drove the country down a path of uh, we will learn by doing, we will test out, you know, policy after policy and throw ideology out the window. It's all about if we find something that works, just keep, you know, just do that. Uh, And, and, and so, you know, over the course of those decades, you know, China basically learned by doing. They, they they called it one of the things they called it was like crossing the stream by feeling your way. You know, uh, on the stones uh, in the water, 
And uh, so the young people basically grew up, as you said, in in a world of, you know, much greater prosperity than what their parents. I mean, their parents basically were dealing with food rationing and, and, you know, communal kitchens. And, you know, the kids grew up with a refrigerator and a TV and and all the, you know, the basic comforts. Um, And. The, the the issue for the young is uh, on the positive side, you know, the positive side of the balance sheet is a lot of them have had international exposure. A lot of them have been to U.S. universities. A lot of them, yeah. um, you know, have been on the Internet. And before the Internet was censored, you know, they had a good idea of what was going on in the rest of the world. Um, I would say to people, just Americans should understand that China today uh, anything foreign, you know, whether it's New York Times or Google, all that stuff is blocked. Um, and, and so it's much harder when you're on the internet in China to actually, you know, access the outside world. But anyway, so, uh, so young people basically have been exposed to different ways of doing things. They've been exposed to the West. They've been exposed to our democracy. Um, on the downside, one of the problems is that they have experienced this perpetual upward economic growth. And so their mentality up until recently has probably been more patriotic than their parents. You know, yeah. so the the older generation, uh, particularly the boomer generation, has been very cynical because they grew up at a time where China was just uh, doing horrible things to itself in the Cultural Revolution uh, and and just wasting too much time on ideology and, and you know, class, they call it class struggle. Yeah. Uh, you know, so the older generation is has a, a healthy cynicism and the younger generation does not. And and that is a little bit problematic because, you know, our hope is that the younger generation, as they inherit the reins of power, that they will turn the country in a more positive direction. Um, and, you know, the prediction I made in my book was this, is that I think that Chinese people right now would, for the most part, aspire to a strong one-party state, very similar to Singapore. And what they find attractive about the Singapore, you know, type government is that uh, the uh, allocation of resources is efficient. Uh, There's transparency. There's rule of law. Uh, These are things that don't necessarily exist in China today. Um, so those those three things would be a major improvement on where we are today. Are yeah. they looking for you know one vote, one person? You wake up tomorrow and you can vote for the president of the country. Maybe not right now, um, but they'll you know they're evolving. And and so what I would say is that you know our hope is that this younger generation will uh, apply their world perspective in a way that we won't be so, um, uh, there won't be, there'll be much less hostility between, you know, the United States and China and, you know, that China will, in America, I think will develop a more collegial relationship. Now, the only other problem, yeah, Yeah. I mean, the only other problem with that, Chris, is that 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 takes time, you know, that that could be, Xi Jinping could could be in power for another 10 years. What I, you know, the, what I will say though is, China's history is also marked by some pretty radical stuff happening pretty quickly. Yes, a- and uh, if you have an urban middle class today that continues to see their wealth deteriorate, the loss of confidence that results from that, and that the be loss very of problematic, yeah, very problematic because. It really comes down to not just, you know, I'm going to save my money and I'm not going to buy anything, but they'll look at the leadership and say, these people are incompetent and they shouldn't be in power. And, you know, so that could mean a much faster change, but it also could mean chaos. And and we've seen examples of chaos recently around the world, you know, powers that we thought, you know, were you know, very strong, you know, it, 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 are, are showing themselves not to be quite as strong, you know? Yeah. So it, it's, 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 a, it's a very interesting time. And I, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, like I live in a college town here and the, the college has a huge population of Chinese students. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, I will say we have 
amazing, you know, Chinese restaurants around here, you know, to service that, that population. I mean, like it's, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah. envy, I envy you because I live outside the city of San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it's like, we got some great stuff here and you know, like, we got, we got like, maybe we might probably have like 20 bubble tea, you know, places in a, you know, small you know, town, we're city, I guess here, but, um, yeah, no, it's, it's great. And it, and it's, it's interesting to see that the, the, the Chinese population here, I mean, cause they're, um, they're not, you know, uh, it, they're not people from a third world country. They are right. people coming here with wealth and, you know, they're educated. I mean, they're going to Northwestern university, which is, you know, like ridiculously expensive to send your kid to school at, and yeah. it's hard to get in, you know? So, you know, that's who's coming, you know, and, and they're, you know, they're very progressive and they, they, you know, love, you know, all the trappings of America, you know? Yeah. So it, yeah, it's, I, it's I, interesting. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think that, uh, I, uh, we have a problem now. So we have a huge deficit, uh, between, you know, the young people from China who come here and our young people who go and expose themselves to China. I mean, yeah, really what's totally. happening is, is COVID is, is, has killed, uh, you know, the flow of young Americans, uh, going to visit China. So, uh, we've dropped from, let's say tens of thousands of young people in China for study or for whatever reason to, people less than, you know, just a few hundred. Mm. And um, that doesn't bode well for our relationship with China, because I, I do believe that, you know, in the same way that we have hopes for the Chinese younger generation, we also have hopes that the U.S. younger generation, you know, will engage in some way and expose themselves in some way. They don't have to dedicate their career to China. But, you know, as I mentioned, if, if Chinese companies are coming to America, uh, what a great opportunity to jump on board that. Um, yeah. And, you know, as we can see, like I can see out here in the tech industry that, you know, Tesla has a huge pipeline of people who go over there. They they make more Tesla cars in Shanghai than they make in the United States. Uh, yeah. App, Apple, while they're uh, pretty quiet about how many people they send over there, they obviously have a lot of people who are engaged in you know sure. sourcing stuff out of China. So I, there are a lot of business opportunities for young people from the United States. Uh, and, and as I said, I mean, it's like, you know, bridging into China and bridging from China into the United States. Yeah, I, I think there's great opportunity in both Asia and Africa, actually. I yes. think, you know, young entrepreneurs might want to take a strong look at what's going on in both of those regions and, uh, you know, find the opportunity. I mean, it's easy, you know, going back to, again, why did I leave the United States? Uh, most of my American friends in 19... 19- you know, 86, we're like, why are you even thinking about leaving the United States? You should be settling down here. And mm-hmm. and and so I, I do strongly encourage young people. It's a time of your life when you have no commitments. Um, and, and the world is actually really, it, it is exotic. It is very engaging. You know, one of the funny things I write at the end of my book, uh, Chris, I have a chapter about coming home to America. Yeah. And, and probably the hardest thing that my wife and I dealt with was that, When we lived in China, you know, we spoke Chinese to the locals and, you know, we ate Chinese food. And and so we were distracted by the local culture and the local people. And when you come to back to America, that distraction goes away. And, you know, the the life of, you know, the rat race is totally in your face and there's nothing to, you know, <laughs> to pull your attention away from that. You know, I have to right. drive the kids to sports. I have to do yeah. all these errands. You know, I have to play, play, play the family vacation. <laughs> uh, so, so the, the distraction, you know, the, 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 uh, the entertainment value of being overseas for a young person is very high. I really appreciate you coming on. What 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 is next for you? That's a good question. So uh, I'm now living in Northern California. Uh, <laughs> I'm a consultant to you know various things. the The last thing I did in China, you know, I woke up one morning and I realized that foreigners were getting squeezed out of China by local talent, um, and I ended up deciding that uh, as the Swiss do watches, the Americans do airplanes and jet engines. So I ended up in commercial aviation um, trading. Uh, old airplanes and jet engines for, you know, for salvage. So uh, here in America, I do commercial aviation. I, I have clients in Dallas and I have clients in Florida. 
Uh, and, uh, I enjoy that a lot. And then other than that, I mean, I, you know, my wife and I enjoy hiking and biking here in beautiful California. There's, there's a lot to do in Northern California. I, I'm, I'm envious, you know? <laughs> um, well, Hey man, thanks so much. This is, we've obviously, you know, run really over, but, yeah. uh, it was such a fun conversation. I didn't <laughs> I get sucked in, you know? Um, so awesome, awesome story. Um, People can find risky business in rising China on Amazon, Amazon at Amazon yeah. and you know your 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 favorite bookstore perhaps. I don't know if there are any of those left. We're, we're working on that. You know, independent <laughs> when you publish on your own, you you don't have a sugar. It's daddy hard to get into the independent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, maybe you'll do a book tour or something. Yeah, and yeah. You can, you kind of hit those. So, um, really appreciate you being on. Great stuff. Uh, you know, really interested in what happens from here because it's. It's these are interesting times in which we live. So. Yeah, and similar to I, I, I watch it every day. I, I, I'm probably you know, sort of addicted to uh, the, the the news stream out of China, yeah. uh, but it's fun and it, it was a great pleasure, Chris, to talk to you today. Well, thanks so much. Thanks for watching. I'd love to hear from you in the comments, and if you could give us a like, think about subscribing, and maybe even share this. And I will see you in the next one. Move and the move.